Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Did you hear that? I, I, I think I did. It must mean something special. Oh. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and elf-like co-host, Scott Hemingway. My bones are brittle. <laughs> yeah, and you're like an elf. I, I'm shrinking away. I'm petite. You're a little man. I am. Does your mom call call you my little man? <laughs> no, I don't think she's ever called me oh. my little man. <laughs> no, my mom used to call me monkey. Really? Oh yeah. I don't. I don't remember any uh, affectionate nicknames from my parents. Oh my god, that explains a lot. There you go, Shit. serial killer. The views and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Well, maybe not for this episode so much. <laughs> We're not experts on in any of the topics we present, nor are we professional journalists. We're just two regular Canadians interested in crime and the darker side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your Santa hat and hang your stocking. <laughs> Grab yourself an eggnog and a Yule log. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine holiday style. Wow, we made it all the way to our second holiday special. Right? Our first right? one was a lot of fun. Yeah. And I think we're going to have the same kind of fun this time that we had last time. You mean serious topics. Oh my gosh, this guy is a horrible, yeah. horrible, let's, loathsome. Let's not diminish Yeah. what this man has done. Oh, and, and and speaking of, of eggnog, am I the only one who really enjoys eggnog? I love eggnog. Like, small doses, like I can't drink like a giant. Well, I can have a, like a big glass, but it's not like I can like oh let me go back for more. But my God, in in the, in the right amount of dose, it's great. I drank a lot of eggnog one time, but there was something else in it. Oh, and I got very very ill. Oh, was it was it? It uh, was rum. Streptococcal. No, rum? it was rum. Oh, oh. oh. so I drank. <laughs> An inordinate amount of rum and oh. eggnog one time. So, so much wasn't about the eggnog. Well, that was just a vehicle to I'm get the I'm certain rum it was in. the eggnog. It had nothing to do with the alcoholism. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Anyway, last year we talked about a serial burglar, St. Nicholas, or more commonly, Santa Claus. He's still at large and will most likely break into your house this Christmas while you're in bed farting away and dreaming of tomorrow's turkey. We got the real heavy hitter out of the way in that episode. No one has broken into more houses than that guy, and he continues to do so. Not to mention his reckless speeding across the sky every Christmas Eve with his sled whipping the crap out of his reindeer. We don't really want to revisit how he treats his elves, either. Yeah, I mean, I was just astounded by... Uh, what a, by, by the crimes that man committed. Absolutely, he would, didn't follow labor no. rules. Oh my God! All no, day, flag, all night, they were disregard of yeah, labor. Laws. They didn't get breaks. No, and they still don't. No, and they work year round. Who the hell's making those toys? And it ain't Santa. These guys are working year Sometimes round. Sometimes there's blood on your toys yeah. because they're little fingers. They've been bleeding. Yeah, no, so sorry. Have you ever seen their little bloody fingers? It's really sad. It is sad. Yeah. The Santa Claus guy was also a murderer. He was responsible for the hit and run of an elderly woman who was walking home after a few rum and eggnogs with her family. 
She left behind a widower and a large family of formerly deniers of Santa's existence. Her story is told in the very sad song, Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. can Google that and uh, if you want to be horrified. It's, uh, so, it's so sad to just, you know, when you hear the tale, especially put... put it, can you imagine, like, you find your grandmother with, like, a paw prints up her face and, and, and sleigh marks on her back? And, no, and, and then to have it put into a song that people sing every Christmas. Yeah, they seem to take a little glee in like it. That's like they, just, they're making fun. I, I'm not okay with that kind of... Uh, uh, it hurts me deeply. Yes. Yeah. I feel deeply concerned for the planet yeah. if people are laughing about making little a, old ladies being run over. Making a mockery of her death in song. Not cool. No. If you haven't heard last year's episode, go back and give it a listen. Uh uh, because we'll be taking a break uh, between Christmas and New Year's, so yeah, yeah, this will be our last episode of 2018. Wow, God, we we made it through a whole year. Uh, another year. Even though the subject of this episode isn't quite the global perpetrator Santa is, he does take a page out of Old Father Christmas's book of evil. He too is a housebreaker, but worse, this guy's a thief who is responsible for the theft of an entire town's Christmas. Yeah, yeah, I, I've I've heard of this guy. I've heard of him. He, he's quite... Uh, he's he's quite of, well known. He's a part of folklore. Yeah, I mean, he's been fictionalized in, in first and children's books, yeah, which is kind of weird. I guess Grimm's fairy tales are very dark. Yeah, okay. But uh, he's also been in cartoons, multiple feature films, and there's even one in theaters now. They, they try to glorify this guy in some ways. And, and even, even play it down. Exactly. You know? Exactly. There's even been plays and musicals. Little kids will do musical numbers in their little schools <laughs> at Christmas time about Shame. this guy. Shame. Terrible. Shame. His name has become synonymous with one who hates Christmas. Mm -hmm. Many of these versions expand on the original telling of the story, uh, but it was first told in poetic form by Dr. Theodore Seuss Giesel, or also known as Dr. Seuss. Oh. Very intelligent man. Yeah. Is he a foot doctor? No. Oh. Seuss was a well-known children's author from the U.S. who wrote moral and often political tales like Horton Hears a Who and Green Eggs and Ham. Uh, in 1957, however, Dr. Seuss penned a holiday-themed story about a crime that rocked the small town of Whoville, titled How the Grinch Stole Christmas. This original telling in the cartoon, also written by Seuss nine years later, will be the source material that we'll reference here. All of those other subsequent Hollywood versions I don't believe are canon. I'm not sure of the veracity of the facts that they're delivering. I think mm. they've, they've sillied it up. As happens. As happens. As happens. You know, and People it's it's the, irresponsible. Yeah, yeah. People want to sensationalize. Exactly. You might be saying that, Mike, it's not a Canadian story, but I disagree. Mm -hmm. The Grinch lived on Mount Crumpet. Yep, yep. And the only Mount Crumpet I can find mm -hmm. is right here in British Columbia. Yeah. It's about 66 kilometers north of here. Yep. Near Squamish. Yeah, beautiful. We've been there. So... If you are up on top of Mount Crumpet, looking down mm -hmm. is a small town. And that town is Squamish. Mm -hmm. What I think is that Seuss changed the names to protect the innocent. Just like a good movie should do. Exactly. So yeah. Squamish yeah. became Whoville. But your research is impeccable. Um, I, think, I think you nailed it. It's ver easily verifiable uh, with a simple Google search. Uh, search Mount Crumpet, that's C-R-U-M-P-I-T, and Squamish, and you will see that some people actually believe this is Whoville. Yep. So Squamish is Whoville. Mount Crumpet is where the Grinch lives. Yeah. Or lived. It seems so clear-cut that, that that is the case. Speaking of clear-cutting, it was uh, Squamish was actually a logging town to begin with, so... Oh. You like that segue? I, that was a beautiful segue. It's interesting. I don't know. Usually here in Canada, we have publication bans on things involving children. Yep. And as there were a lot of children in this tale, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps everybody's name becomes who? Their last name becomes who? Uh, I mean, you've, you got, know? you've got to protect the innocent. So the who identity. are they? Yep. They are the residents of Squamish. Yep. So Nailed it. People in Squamish... Dude. Uh, sorry. People in Whoville... 
are tight lipped about this case that happened sometime in, in the mid fifties, the nineteen fifties, and when it was a logging town, uh, of hard working who's. Okay, yep. Yeah. Uh I've chatted with some of the who's in Whoville and no one seems to remember these events. Mm. But uh I'm not sure if everybody's being truthful with me. It might be that it was a long time ago and there's no one left who really remembers. The older folks we spoke with, however, uh, were quite cagey. They would stare at me blankly or tell me I was off my rocker for asking them about this. Mm. So is it a cover up? Well, I think a few things. There's a there's a couple of reasons why you wouldn't want it. The town wouldn't want to talk about it. You don't want looky lose. Right. You know, you don't like, it's like, okay. We talked about it was, in the Ed Gein episode. We did. The we other did. Day. It's yeah. like, okay, we've been through enough. Like we don't, we want to move forward. Like let's we we can't keep having people come in, Mike, and bringing this tale up, Mike. Okay. So yeah, I you're mean, right. You're right. So I I think like that that's it. Uh, that to me stands out as one of the key reasons why why they. So I don't know so much of it to cover up, but uh, that could be a part of it. But I think they just they just want to move forward, man. So the name Grinch. Yep. I looked up the name Grinch because it has to be some pseudonym of some sort. So I went to Canada four one one. Yeah, yeah. Dot uh, ca, and I looked there, and there's no Mister Grinches anywhere in Canada oh. that I can see. In fact, it did bring up one hit for the name Grinch, and there is an, an actual Grinch realties in Montreal, Quebec. Oh, and so maybe they're relatives, or again, maybe they're familiar with the story and making fun. Oh, I hope it's not the latter. Well, I'm, uh, you know. People are irresponsible like that. So. It's true. Anything to get a t eyes on your companies. But maybe maybe we're completely wrong. I didn't call Grinch Realties because uh, I didn't want to deal with the negativity that I've been dealing with every time I ask somebody about yeah, it. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. Whoville. And do you think they're all going, oh, yeah, yeah, no, he was our great uncle. No. 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 Not. No. So here's a bit of the story. All the Who's in Whoville loved Christmas. It was to them the most important holiday of the year. Decorating for the big day was not only a family, but largely a community affair. Standing heart to heart and hand in hand, they welcomed Christmas every year. They'd head off into the woods and cut down the best looking tree they could find. Then they'd drag the majestic now-dying tree back to Whoville through the ever-present snow. This is before global warming, obviously, due to clear-cutting of this kind. Horrendous. I remember much more snow as a child. They'd erect the tree in the town square. Everyone happily came out to decorate the poor tree. With Christmas stuff like bingle balls and hoo fluff. I'm not sure what those things are, but they sound festive. The Who's would decorate the entire town inside and out, singing and playing music as they went. They'd decorate their pets, and even each other. The sounds of their revelry could be heard for many kilometers in every direction, echoing through the valley and the mountains above. One neighbor of Whoville hated the festivities. He loathed the Who's and their happiness at this time of year. This is the person we know as the Grinch or Mr. Grinch. But that season, the Grinch had a plan. It was a scheme to ruin Christmas and break the spirit of the Who's once and for all. How uh, murder is the worst crime, but in many regards, this is up there. Like that Christmas, like this is a time universally that we just, it's about 
joy, happiness, love, togetherness. Togetherness, yeah. Like, who wants to ruin that? What kind of a person? Well, clearly the Grinch. Yes, but I mean, like... But we'll dig into it. You, oh. may, you may actually come around to this guy. I don't think so. Like, how did that's going to be I actually, I actually warmed up to him as yeah. I was writing. Well, I'm going to try to stay open, but my hate scale is... is okay, yeah, end. right now, right now. Yeah. So it's okay to be there right Wee. now. So who was the Grinch? Nothing is known of his childhood or young adulthood or how he became the way he was. The Grinch made an earlier appearance in another story by Seuss called Who The Hubub and the Grinch. Oh. In that story, Grinch convinced the Hubub that a piece of string he had for sale was worth more than the sun. Wow. But it was only 98 cents and the Hubub could have his own. It's still expensive string. The hubub fell for the scam and bought the plain old green string and the Grinch made off with the cash. Seuss ends the story by saying, And I'm sorry to say that Grinches sell hububs such things every day. And I think I've met a few Grinches if that's the case. Yeah, so I'm not convinced yet, Mike. Well, it's, it's, a, it's not a good beginning. Whee! It's not yeah. a good beginning. Yeah. So it was December 24th, Christmas Eve, many years ago when the Grinch put his plan into action. The Grinch was staring down over the valley watching the Who's do their thing, wishing he could stop Christmas from coming. His major concern was the noise that came along with the holiday, as the children played with their toys and banging and singing. As well, the bells of the town would ring out incessantly until the whole town gathered around the huge tree in the square to sing carols. This made him crazy. From Dr. Seuss' story, Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, will stand close together with Christmas bells ringing. They'll stand hand in hand, and those who's will start singing. They'll sing, and they'll sing, and they'll sing, sing, sing. The Grinch's hate of noise could indicate a seriously debilitating case of misophonia. According to misophonia.com, the definition of misophonia is hatred of sound, but a person with misophonia does not hate all sound. They're only sensitive to certain sounds, and those sounds are usually unique to each person. So Christmassy sounds for the Grinch. Pretty much any sound can become a problem for a person with misophonia. Often, these sounds are some kind of background noise. Another common type of trigger sound is mouth and nasal noises, chewing, sniffing, etc. Perhaps for the Grinch, the joyful sounds of Christmas were actually painful. We in no way mean to offend or minimize the experience of actual sufferers of misophonia. We're aware that the pain some people feel upon hearing certain sounds is real, and we personally know sufferers. We are simply trying to explain the behavior of the Grinch and want to leave no stone unturned. The Grinch had an idea. What if he stole Christmas? No, that's a stupid idea. Well, why would anyone want to do such a thing? Well, I guess maybe to shut up the no to shut the noise off, but exactly. also because he's a jerk. Well, what do you think was wrong with this person? What do you, oh clearly maybe if we're going to dig into this some childhood traumas, you know, maybe he was uh, he never got a Christmas. He he was always um uh, he was beaten viciously at Christmas time well, and so those were tra- things would be horrible. They would be, but they don't justify Thefting Christmas from everybody in Hoosville. By taking away every tree, ornament, decoration, and gift, he might be able to prevent the noise that he claimed to have been torturing him for 53 years. There have been many attempts to determine which sort of psychological and physical issues the Grinch may have been tormented by. We've already talked about misophonia, which could have been just one of the plethora of problems the Grinch was saddled with. Yep, still no sympathy from me. I love Christmas. My kids love Christmas. Screw this guy. So it was also said that his shoes were too small. Then get bigger shoes. Some people even said that his head wasn't screwed on quite right. 
that could have been metaphor, though. You know, I'm, I'm thinking so. I mean, I don't think he was uh, assembled. Probably one of the best descriptions of the Grinch comes from the song You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch. Mm -hmm. And it was sung by the amazingly deep voice of Thurl Ravenscroft. What a great name. That is fantastic. Uh, Ravenscroft also spent over 50 years as a voice behind Kellogg's Frosted Flake spokesman, Tony the Tiger. Oh, my God. They're really? great. Oh, I, I love that, man. Well, we'll break down a few of the song's verses to better understand the Grinch's twisted psyche and what he might have been about. So it begins, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. Clearly. I agree. Maybe people had, had other experiences with him that made him appear mean, too. You really are a heel. You're as cuddly as a cactus. You're as charming as an eel, Mr. Grinch. Uh, which are not cuddly nor charming. No, so he had a crappy personality and was prickly and had no charisma. Exactly. I concur. It's also said that he was a bad banana with a greasy black peel. Oh, my God. That's the worst. It sounds like a bad apple. He does. He, he couldn't get in the Ember Yard. No, well, I would let him in. Oh, my God, Mike. Then you deal if with him. If he could answer the questions. Then you deal with him. Yeah, fair enough. Well, at the very least, he was grumpy. Yeah, clearly. The next verse goes, You're a monster, Mr. Grinch. Oh. Your heart's an empty hole. Your brain is full of spiders. You have garlic in your soul, Mr. Grinch. Well, now, if those were actually physical uh, ailments that he suffered from, I, I have some empathy. I think that's more metaphor. Oh. An empty oh, heart oh, and a oh, brain okay. full of spiders and a garlic in his soul could indicate major depression. <sighs> wow. And I can, I can empathize with that. Perhaps he suffered such a terrible case of seasonal affective disorder or SAD, that would go a long way to explaining his particular loathing for Christmas. I think we need to recognize, though, that understanding doesn't mean agreeing. I understand that might be what I have been personally diagnosed with seasonal affective disorder. You see this light I do. here that I have to use every day. Yes. Otherwise, I go insane. Yes, but that, and I become grumpy. And I understand that, Mike, but that if you wanted to steal Christmas from everybody, I still wouldn't be cool with it. I, well, I could under, understand in and agree in or different. If only I could have bought the Grinch a light. <laughs> Where would he plug it in? He lives on a bloody mountain. In a cave. Yeah. From mayoclinic.org's article on seasonal affective disorder, SAD begins and ends at about the same times every year. Oh. If you're like most people with SAD, your symptoms start in the fall and continue into the winter months sapping your energy and making you feel moody. Less often, SAD causes depression in the spring or early summer. Treatment for SAD may include light therapy, medications, and psychotherapy, all things that I endorse and have made me feel better. See, so you seek treatment to improve those. He didn't. I mean, I get it at different times. Well, it was the 50s. I get that. But he, he, he's not doing anything. Here's some signs and symptoms of seasonal affective disorder. Oh, God, I'm afraid I'm going to be diagnosed after this. Feeling depressed most of the day, nearly every day. Losing interest in activities you once enjoyed. Having low energy. Having problems with sleeping. Experiencing changes in your appetite or weight. Feeling sluggish or agitated. Having difficulty concentrating. Feeling hopeless, worthless, or guilty. And having frequent thoughts of death or suicide. So I think that's what the Grinch was going through. There's no way that anybody who is miserable as him is not depressed. Man, I, I don't disagree, Mike. I just He needed help, Scott. It just doesn't justify his actions is all I'm saying. I get that, but he that doesn't make it okay for him to behave the way I'm he not is. justifying his behavior. I am just trying to It seems like you are to help explain it. To humanize him. Okay, okay. To degrinchify him. I, I get what you're doing. From a CBC article, the Grinch appears to be suffering from an almost textbook case of antisocial personality disorder with depressed mood, said Todd Hill, a clinical psychologist in Halifax. Symptoms include failure to conform to social norms. Yeah. Deceitfulness. Yeah. Irritability and aggressiveness. That is the best description I think I've ever seen of the, the Grinch. Textbook antisocial disorder with a depressed mood. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I can support that. Christmas can bring out the worst of most people, said Hill, noting all of his clients in the last three weeks have complained about stress and pressure they feel to buy, visit, 
and fulfill some impossible ideal of holiday happiness. It's a stressful time of year. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree. And I felt that like that for years. Yeah. Yeah, I I can I me too. I get it. There are some stranger points with the Grinch too. He's green. This, I mean, this is something we need to get to the root of. So here's what I think causes the green color. Oh, okay. I think I can explain this very, very well. Okay, okay. So another more telling verse of You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch, calls him a sinful sot. A sot, according to Webster, is an alcoholic or habitual drunkard. Yeah. Perhaps this was his method of self-medicating his depression. Yeah, probably. Um. If he had been doing it for as long as he claimed mm -hmm. uh, to be suffering, even 40 of those 53 years would be hell on his liver. Yeah. And he could be suffering from cirrhosis of the liver. Oh. Which is a real and eventually deadly result of chronic alcoholism. Yes, yes. Uh, if he was suffering from cirrhosis, he would be jaundiced. Okay. And taking on a yellowish hue. He, correct. He's here. We have yellow. We got yellow. Yes, not green. It was also rumored that his heart was three sizes too small. Yeah. So he may have been suffering cyanotic congenital heart disease. So sufferers take on a bluish hue. Oh. As they are not receiving enough oxygen. So you you mix yellow, yellow and blue. And what do you get? You get green. Oh, that's, uh, so, wow. the Grinch had this congenital heart disease. Yeah. He has cirrhosis of the liver. Yeah. He's depressed. He's got antisocial uh, mood disorders. Yeah. Sounds like he's a pretty messed up cat. You're, you're pretty much like Canada's Sherlock Holmes, Mike. I, I well, I'm very flattered. Yeah, as you should be. And, the, and I'm talking about like the Benedict Cumberbatch one. One can only imagine the level of resentment that would have built up over a span of more than half a century. Yeah, yeah. The toll that kind of hate takes on a person is palpable. It has to be awful on your body. Clearly. To be filled with that much hate. Clearly. No one who feels that miserable wants to see or hear other people being happy. Yeah, I, and again, I've been there, but um, I didn't ruin everybody else's lives. Just a handful. If the Grinch had escaped Mount Crumpet, even as a preteen... It would put the Grinch sort of north of 60 years old, I think. So he was a senior citizen. Yep. So there's no, uh, there's not much chance that he'd be alive now another 61 years Oh no. on. No, so no. I think the Grinch would have passed away. Yeah, clearly. Somehow, even as old as he was, the Grinch was driven by his burning hatred of Christmas and he set about to enact his plan. Oh. First, he thought, if he were to dress as Santa Claus, he'd be able to explain his presence to anyone in the town that night. Very deceptive. With his dog, Max, acting as forced labor, the Grinch created a Santa suit from crap he had laying around in his cluttered and dirty old cave. Not having a reindeer, the Grinch tied heavy antlers to Max's head. He went to work in the dark. He loaded up his busted old sled with empty sacks and a ladder, again forcing Max into service, pulling the sled. A poor dog. This was unnecessary, as the momentum carried the sled down the side of Mount Crumpet quite easily. He went house to house, sliding down the chimney Santa-style, stealing every single Christmas-related item in each residence right down to the Christmas trees. He stole candy canes out of the hands of sleeping children. He even took food from the families. From Dr. Seuss's story. Then he slunk to the ice box. He took the Who's feast. He took the Who pudding. He took the roast beast. And he didn't even like roast beast. He cleaned out the ice box as quick as a flash. Why that Grinch even took the last can of Who hash. I'm telling you, I've always wanted some Who pudding, though. I'm a big who, uh, pudding fan, and I've always, uh, uh, curious. It's one of fa Carol's favorite words is pudding. It's a it's a great word, and it's yummy. But, yeah, again, this guy's a douche. 
In one of the homes, the Grinch was caught in the act of stuffing their Christmas tree up the chimney by a precocious two-year-old named Cindy Lou Who. Yeah, we all know Cindy Lou Who. What a oh, beautiful my, little girl. My heart. She asked why he was taking their tree. Yeah. Thinking fast, he lied to the youngster, saying he needed to repair the tree's faulty lights at his workshop, and he'd bring it back. <sighs> Cindy bought his fibs, and she went back to bed. Mm. Can you imagine your kids running into this kind of old creep in your house in the middle of the night on Christmas Eve? Well, that's what I keep doing. I keep putting my daughters in place of Cindy Lou Who, and I'm picturing picturing sweet little Bibby. Yeah. Seeing the, some green entity stealing our Christmas tree. And and she's got, she'd be so sweet to be like, oh, okay, I believe you. And then in the morning... She'd be heartbroken, Mike. Can you picture little Bibby crying where the tree? Well, not to, to be? mention she would probably feel guilty for not waking you up to tell you about probably. it. Probably that, and that doesn't. She doesn't need that kind of. That she would take that victim's guilt and internalize it, and it would ruin her forever. She doesn't need that, and, and her big sister Violet would be just trying to comfort her, and 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 we would, as parents, feel like we have failed. Like, <sighs> screw you, Grinch. The Grinch finished his work, stealing everything Christmassy from every home in Whoville, and he loaded it all onto his sleigh. He took all the outdoor decorations as well as the large tree from the town square. He took those infernal bells too, so the Who's would have nothing to ring. The population of Whoville at the time must have been around 5,000, so it had to be quite a haul of thousands of kilograms piled up on his sled. It's unclear how he got everything back up to the top of Mount Crumpet. Seuss claimed 10,000 feet, but I think that was poetic license that he was taking, as the summit is just over 1,000 feet. His dog, Max, was the size of a beagle. It's hard to imagine the extremely vicious amount of whipping that would have enabled such a small dog to get up this mountain, which is very steep in parts. Some believe that the Grinch may have been using a snowmobile or another vehicle of some sort to move such a large load so high up. This took him the rest of the night. It's rumored that the Grinch made it to the peak of Mount Crumpet as dawn was breaking. His intent, his intent was to dump Whoville's Christmas goodies down the side of the mountain, destroying the lot of it. So you, you, nobody's ever mentioned it, and you, you haven't mentioned it, but what about the thought of, a, of an accomplice or two? Because that is a lot of stuff for one person and one beagle. But he, them. yeah, I, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. In my opinion, you'd have to have some assistance. I wonder if any maybe of, there were only four houses in Whoville at the time. I wonder, I wonder if Santa's elves were actually oh, some that's, disgruntled elves helping out. Could have been, you know, because they're probably pretty pissed about Christmas. Their whole life is like dedicated to making stuff as slaves. Yeah, I'm just saying. I'm just throwing it out there. It could be. Yeah. Legend has it that as the sun broke the horizon. The Grinch was listening for the sounds of sadness in the town. He'd be happy with that. He didn't want to hear that other singing. Instead, he heard the Who's singing their Christmas carols a cappella because they had no bells to ring. I, never, I love a good a cappella. I mean, look at Boys to Men. Great job. At first, the Grinch was really confused. Christmas had come despite his massive B&E crime spree. From Dr. Seuss's book on the case, and the Grinch with his Grinch feet, ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Whew. That's a lot of puzzling. And you, and you don't want a sore puzzler. No. I've had it a couple of times. and it's. I it's, can't imagine standing in the snow and thinking for three hours. No, you need ointments. Or unguents. Uh, oh, 
Wow. <laughs> like how it went there. Yeah, or a poultice. <laughs> wow. Somebody's been playing some Red Dead Redemption. <laughs> yes, I must have been. <laughs> Here's where things get a little weird. At least they've been pretty weird so far already. I'm just saying. Really? It's, it's one of our typical stories. But it, like, not most of our stories have a green person. Fair enough. At this point, the Grinch was said to have realized that Christmas was not a material thing, as he'd assumed. Mm -hmm. But it was about a certain spirit, a spirit of giving and togetherness. Absolutely, yep. Something the Grinch definitely lacked, as he yearned for connection and love deep within himself. Yes, I, I get it. Seuss then goes on to claim that the Grinch's heart grew three sizes that day, and from that point on, he was a changed person. Hmm. As far as I'm aware, an enlarged heart is not a good thing. So perhaps Seuss meant this metaphorically well, as well. Let's not forget, his heart was three sizes too small. So now... It's normal size. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. So I, I guess that negativity is what had shrunk his heart. And now it's growing back. Uh, but again, man... Overcome with positivity, the Grinch is said to have driven like a maniac back down the mountain and distributed the toys and decorations back to the fine Who's in Whoville. All of these things were most likely broken from bouncing around in this sled, but it's the thought that counts, right? For sure, for sure. That, that, that was a wonderful gesture, and I'm sure he felt good in the process. Apparently, the Grinch even carved and doled out the roast beast at a community Christmas dinner that night. Hmm. The community had forgiven him. That really says more about the community than the Grinch. Well, I don't know. I I had that same moment in my life, that moment of clarity, mm -hmm. as some of my friends call it. Mm -hmm. When it happens, it could be fleeting, but maintaining a positive attitude of gratitude is an action you can take to ensure this moment is a defining one. William James, American philosopher, psychologist, and author, wrote a book called The Varieties of Religious Experience about spiritual conversions, both sudden and of the educational variety. He said that the characteristics of a spiritual experience are, quote, a paradise of inward tranquility seems to be faith's usual result. The transition from tenseness, self-responsibility and worry to equanimity, receptivity and peace is the most wonderful of all those shiftings of inner equilibrium. Those changes of personal center of energy which I have analyzed so often, and the chief wonder of it, that it so often comes about not by doing, but by simply relaxing and throwing the burden down. Oh, so, so the Grinch yeah. had a spiritual awakening. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and I'm sure what That's felt, like redemption, you know, like that's that's the path to redemption and right we there. All, we all love those stories. We all love a good turnaround and a comeback. But um, I, I just, wish all our stories could end with redemption. For uh, sure. Real change For sure. and forgiveness in the community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've seen it. I've seen redemption. I've, I've, I've felt it. Yes. I've seen people crawl out of hell in real life, and I've clawed my own way out of my own hell with the help of a few amazing humans. The holidays are a hard time of year for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They miss family, dwell on the hard times of Christmas's past or better days. Uh, I found the holidays difficult myself for years and years, but I have lots of friends and family that I can lean on. Even if they don't understand why I'm blue, they're there for me. Oh, he's green, you're blue. You know? Mm. Knowing I have people in my corner means the world to me when the demons take hold. Absolutely. So that's all the Grinch needed was just some people behind him, maybe. Maybe his realization, it said that he never behaved the same again. That it did take him into, uh, I you know I think he did the toy drive with the with the bikers and stuff the next year and uh, and, and again I I love a good redemption story but uh, and he, you know, he 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 began in uh, Cindy Lou Who's lawn yeah mowed it every every few weeks <sighs> for free well okay I don't loathe him as much right uh, you know um so you got like here's the thing. The guy did his time. Did he? Well, he he made amends to the to the to the town. He cre he he perpetrated criminal acts with the intent to hurt 
That was his intent. Yep. Was to hurt. And he he accomplished that, I'm sure. The town overcame that quickly. Which is good for them. Which is great for them. We're hoping every town can be like that. But but the hurt he initially caused, little poor Cindy Lou who that pain was real. But it's something he, she can overcome, and I'm sure that she has. Uh, I'm again, If only a, Cindy Lou if you're listening, is Cindy Lou who if you are listening, please uh, send us an email, a voicemail, something. Please. Let us know what your thoughts are my, my on, con- on The Grinch. My concerns are and always have been with you, Cindy. Yeah. And your town folk. We, we care about you, Cindy. I'm glad The Grinch turned things around. I'm glad. Uh, I, I hope he's only continuing. Well, I think he's dead. But I hope he continued to do good. Which is what I I believe happened. Yeah, well, you're a kind soul. There you go. So you know, I I still I still feel anger when hearing about him. So when you when you think about the Grinch, like what is your what's your what's your what's your problem with him? So, like why why won't you let him off the hook after he he has the realization? I have fundamental problems with people who get their joy from hurting others, which is what he was doing. Tear down others to make yourself feel better instead of succeeding based on your character and your strengths. You're going to tear down others so that you can feel better. That's a trait that I've seen a lot working, oh, yeah. in, working in a corporate ent- yes. world for for a very long time. You see that as a trademark of how people want to succeed. And I've always loathed it. And he is the quintessential example of trying to tear down others, hurt others, so he can feel better. And that's just, I've, I have fundamental issues with that. And again, glad that he has rehabilitated himself. Yeah, I, I'm glad uh, that uh, I, I I don't want to see him suffer or hurt. I don't want to see him in any more pain either. But he, the act is what I can't get over. The act, the intent in that act, impacts me. So interesting. Yeah. So what what you're saying is that if you have done the, that one bad thing in your life, you are forever that bad thing. But that wasn't a bad. That's not like he stole some bubble gum from a store. He well, was, it is. It's you know. It's just no, no, shades he, of. No, 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 no. That's a slippery slope. No, no. He stole everything Christmas related from an entire town, and then he gave it back. Presents broken and such from all the movement. Well, they, just think of the the hard work that that parents put into acquiring. It sounds, this sounds very resentful. It, yeah, I'm resentful. Why are you resentful about the Grinch? It could have been my kids, man. It wasn't, though. It could have been. I, none of the other crimes we cover were me, but I still, I still feel it. Well, that's bad. No, that's, that's Are you em- seeking help? That's called empathy. Oh. Yeah, man. I don't Jeez. have any of that. Clearly not. I'm kidding. Grinch. Uh. So that's it for the story of the Grinch. Yeah. We want to send some Christmas messages out to everybody, oh. and we're just going to kind of wing this. Okay. I want to I want to thank everybody who has become a fan of or supporter of or listener of our show over the last year. It means the world to us that we have uh, such a close-knit community mm. of people who are truly caring individuals who like literally I'm, I watch every day in the Yumber Yard people looking out for each other yeah yeah you know yeah and you know we have our moments in there we have like it's like any family yep there's there's a spat yep. now and again yep but I just love this community that has kind of grown up around us and it it really it warms my heart yeah I, I couldn't agree more and, and I, I'm thankful for the real human connections developed through through there through the podcast through the community like there's yeah we've gotten to know so many of them and like they it, they're real people yeah they're real people and they genuinely care and they're genuinely interested in in you and I yeah like as people and 
Uh, Everybody has been so kind. I, I can't, like, yeah, the people I've met, the people I've talked to, the people I've had any interaction with are just just so genuine and kind. Uh, especially around, uh, I, I bring it up every now and again, but episode 10 when I yep. told my story, yep. uh, the reactions that people have and had or, and continue to have actually, cause I get talked to about it continually. Yeah. And when people come to that episode, um, I really was scared when I did that episode yeah. and I didn't want to put myself out there the way I did, but I thought it was necessary because I had seen some other people do it. And I thought, man, that's a courageous thing to do mm -hmm. to, to share that story and what I realized is that listening to them helped me. And I thought, well, I guess yep. it works. <laughs> It'll work the other way. Yep. And I might get to help somebody else. So, yeah, I, I was fortunate to have some conversations at the uh, meetup that we did. I was able to share my story with a, a couple of the people and the sincere um, empathy they showed towards me and, uh, compassion is again it's it's you can tell when things are contrived you can tell when reactions and responses are canned and you can tell when they're genuine yeah and, and the people genuinely care and it's just yeah i love our little community i love it this is a tough time of year as i mentioned for a lot of people for sure and uh you know we'll be around the yumber yard and things like that uh throughout christmas so yep. if you if you need to chat Absolutely. Come on, come on in there and like, let's have a conversation. Yep, absolutely. You're, you're not alone. You don't have to be alone at Christmas time. If you can just yap with us in a Facebook group, it's probably going to make you feel better. Absolutely. We'll to we're, we will totally be there. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, our new year. I've got some really big ideas that we want to tackle in the new year as far as uh, Canadian cases. Squee. And some more away games as well. Yeah. So. It's going to be a good year, 2019. Woo, woo. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be our year, buddy. Taking over. Well, I guess so. We're going to take over. But wait, there's more. I wrote a little poem based on the night before Christmas. Mm -hmm. Here goes. "'Twas the night before Christmas when all through the Umber Yard, I was practicing patron names that I thought were hard. The stockings were hung by the fake fireplace with care, in hopes that a story for the next episode soon would be there. The good eggs were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of Nanaimo bars danced in their heads. Carol in her PJs and I in my toque, thinking about my browser history making me look like a kook. I was reading an article dealing with blood spatter when I was surprised by a photo of someone's brain matter. Away to the toilet, I flew for a barf, and when I got there, I threw up on my scarf. My barfing woke Carol who jumped out of bed. She ran up the stairs thinking me dead. No, there I was, head hung over the crapper. She snapped a quick photo of my looking so dapper. Into the yumber yard she went posting the pic. She continued to giggle as I was real sick. Just then came a knock, unexpected that late. Carol yelled to the knocker, hang on, please wait. Carol bounced down the stairs to go say hello. I had stopped barfing, my legs still jello. I wobbled down too as Carol's eyes filled with wonder. Standing there in the doorway was Scott, back from down under. His pale skin was blistered and burned to a crisp. He'd gained no weight at all, he was still a wee wisp. Welcome back, I said, but why are you here? He said to wish you Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I pointed to the clock, noting it was quite late. Scott frowned, looking sad, and said, Sorry, mate. He came inside anyway and opened his bag. He explained he couldn't sleep, he had awful jet lag. He opened a satchel and out came the goodies. 
some Tim Tams for Carol, and a couple of hoodies. Scott grinned as he dragged out the last thing which gave me a fright. From his backpack, he pulled a huge jar of Vegemite. You put it on toast, he said with a shit-eating grin. I grabbed it from him and threw it right in the bin. We laughed and we hugged and we said welcome back. We have stories for the new year. We'll be right back on track. After the hugging, Scott gave us high fives. Then he ran to his Mazda, double parked in the drive. He gave us a yell as he drove out of sight. Happy Christmas to all and to all a good night. Before we go, we want to give some shout outs to our new patron patrons. As we recorded this episode ahead of the Christmas break, it'll just be me thanking this week's patrons and PayPal supporters of the show. So Scott wants to say thank you in advance. Thank you. There you go. So this week's good eggs are, our good eggs this week are Stacy McLeod from Mississauga, Ontario, Dino Champlone, India, Julie Marion from Guntersville, Alabama, Allison Bray, Jerry O'Brien, Kate Watros, and she's from Erickson, Manitoba, Harry Sims, our good buddy on social media, thanks Harry, from Sacramento, California, Shanine Peacock, and she's from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, Wesley DuPont from Charlottesville, Virginia, Heather Powell, from Schwanksville, Pennsylvania. Well, how about them apples? Tim Arbiter from Merritt Island, Florida. Rachel Irvine from Beatrice, Nebraska. Emily Garten. Beth Garipsi Zumwalt. And she's from Waukee, Indiana. Holly Pagnoson Conravery. And she's from East Atlantic Beach, New York. Christelle Johnson from Rogers, Arkansas. Last week I made a mistake with Alaska and Arkansas. I'm really sorry I did that. And finally, Jessica Blyes from Cold Lake, Alberta. I hope I pronounced that last one right. Thank you all for your patronage. And now we'll go on to PayPal. Thank you to Carissa Giesbrecht uh, for your donation on pay- PayPal. Dwayne Burke, Amanda Fenner, and Johanna Lemska, thank you so much for supporting the show. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much to our patrons, past and present, for your pledges. We really appreciate your support of the show. If you want to help support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. Or for one-time support, you can send us some donut money at PayPal at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. Check out our website, www.darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Just search for Dark Poutine. Tell your friends. Don't forget about the Ember Yard. We're there. You can subscribe to us on your favorite podcast directory like iTunes Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever else you get your on-demand audio. That's it for this year. Yeah. Wow. We are done another year in the bag. Wow. So, happy holidays. Hanukkah is already done by this by the time this episode drops. Happy Kwanzaa. Whatever it is that you're celebrating, even if it's just breathing in and out, or Festivus for the rest of us, exactly. we wish you a merry one. Exactly. We want everybody to just be as happy as possible. If you can be, do it. Yep. It's worth it. And don't forget to be a good egg. And not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.